Good morning, film fans. This is Not Too Critical Reviews, the JPC News Show where we give brief reviews for new releases at the local Escondido Cinema. I'm your host, Renard. And I'm Vince Salerno. And th in this episode, we will be reviewing The Martian, Sicario, and the re-release of The Iron Giant. Let's start with what has become the biggest movie in America so far, The Martian, directed by Ridley Scott and written by Drew Goddard based off the best-selling novel by Andy Weir. The Martian centers on Mark Watney, played by Matt Damon. He is an astronaut uh, on a mission on Mars when suddenly a fierce storm forces him and his crew to abandon their mission. Unfortunately, during this storm, he is presumed dead and abandoned by his crew. Miraculously, he survived. But unfortunately, he is now left alone on the desolate red planet with meager supplies, which forces him to grow more food. All of this, however, is still in vain if he cannot make contact with NASA, which, once he is able to achieve, uh, sparks a worldwide effort uh, to bring him back home. Meanwhile, the returning crew is also concocting a dangerous rescue mission that, uh, at the risk of their own lives. So, Vinny, what were your thoughts on The Martian? Well, going into this, Ridley Scott has not had a good track record these past couple of years with, like, Exodus, uh, The Counselor. I could go on about just not mm -hmm. very impressed. But um, going into this, I thought, okay, it's Ridley Scott, it's Matt Damon. Something's gotta, something good has to come out of this. Mm -hmm. And I was blown away. I have not seen a movie like this in a long time. I was impressed with not only Ridley Scott, but Matt Damon, who has really been sort of, I don't know, it feels like he hasn't had a lot of popular films mm -hmm. recently that have gotten the buzz that they deserve. And he definitely deserves the buzz for this film. He has done a great job. His performance really sold me. The one thing I didn't like was how many characters there were. I mean, mm -hmm. it felt like you forget that Matt Damon is alone on Mars because there are so many characters and so many people they try to fit into this movie. And they all serve their purpose, no doubt, but I think they could have lived without a couple of characters. Otherwise, love this film. Definitely, definitely one of my top 10 movies of the year. Yeah, I really love this film as well. It's not a masterpiece by any means, and mm -hmm. the one thing that really uh, sticks out to me in terms of flaws is there's a fair amount of conveniences in this film. You start off first with a fierce storm that forces an emergency evac. Mars is a planet without much of an atmosphere, so whether a storm would happen on such a planet is um, skeptical at mm -hmm, least. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say conveniences. Uh, the, the, the satellite that strikes Mar uh, Mark Watney, uh, that's the only satellite that gives uh, communication capabilities between Mars and NASA. I mean. It's a little bit too far-fetched. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with you on the characters, and especially since the film sort of tries to um, make you remember them by giving you all of these, um, by naming them on the screen. And if I would prefer a good nameplate on a desk over any sort of edited in caption mm -hmm. or adding a name for a location, because the chances are we're gonna forget these things anyway, and they just end up being very, end up being very annoying. They were a little distracting. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were a bit distracting. Um, but even then, I, I, this film is very likable. It's, it, it deserves its runtime because he is stranded there for a good 500 days. Mm -hmm. um, Ridley Scott makes Mars look gorgeous with mm -hmm. that cinematography. Matt Damon puts on a really uh, charismatic, quirky performance. Uh, I would have liked to see more of the psychological drama that would normally accompany a guy who's mm -hmm. abandoned on a planet. But otherwise, you know, e even the soundtrack, how, however manipulative and very disco it is, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a, just a very likable film, and I'm glad America has really responded to it. What would yeah. be your rating for this film? Um, I'd give it, uh, I'm going to go with 8 out of 10. Uh, four out of five stars. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Four out of five stars. It's not quite a masterpiece, but this, <coughs> film, this film is still very impressive, very memorable. Mm -hmm. Definitely see it. Very funny, too. <laughs> yes, it was very funny. 
Okay, so while Vinny gathers his thoughts on the re-release of The Iron Giant, I'm going to review Sicario, the original crime drama directed by French-Canadian Denis Villeneuve and written by Taylor Sheridan. In this film, the drug war between the United States and the drug cartels in Mexico has worsened, and at the center of this conflict uh, is an idealistic FBI agent by the name of Kate Mercer, played in a raw performance by Emily Blunt. At the beginning of the film, she participates in a drug raid in, a, in an Arizonian suburb well north of the American-Mexican border, where a host of dead bodies of violent deaths, not to mention a hidden bomb, awaits them. And that hidden bomb, unfortunately, takes out a few members of her crew. Driven by a desire to make up for uh, their deaths, she decides to volunteer to join a task force led by Josh Brolin and a mysterious Benicio del Toro uh, in an effort to uh, break down the drug network that was responsible for this bombing. Unfortunately, as Kate will soon discover, this task force doesn't exactly do things by the book. In fact, sometimes for this group, no, necessary for this group, the ends justify the means. Director Denise Villeneuve has been responsible for uh, the more sobering cerebral dramas of the past few years, such as On Sunday, Prisoners, a really great film, and the hidden gem from last year, Enemy. And this film follows in that trend. Sicario, I feel, was a film that was made for me. The cinematography by Roger Deakins, still Oscarless, by the way, was gorgeous, cold yet gorgeous. The score by Johan Johansson, uh, while it does follow those typical action motifs, it blasts you and directs your emotions. Uh, Emily Blunt has a, like I said earlier, has a really raw performance, but I feel that the actors who really steal the spotlight from her are the joint supporting performances by Josh Brolin and especially uh, Benicio Del Toro, who plays a dark side of the more optimistic character that he played in the 2000 drug film directed by Steven Soderbergh, Traffic, for which Del Toro won his uh, Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. This film is gorgeous. I love this film. I love the way it did its story. I love the acting. I love how it looks. I love how it sounds. I'm afraid to say it, but Mad Max, you have been dethroned from being my favorite film of the year. Sicario gets five stars from me, the first five-star rating that I have given this year. And it is, as of right now, my new favorite film of 2015. Definitely see it. Okay, so we're segueing from an R-rated crime drama to an animated family drama. This is the re-release of The Iron Giant. We're going to give a little bit of backstory for this film that was originally released in 1999. The director, Brad Bird, whom we know for uh, such works as The Incredibles and Ratatouille, uh, was originally in the early 90s an animator for such shows like The Simpsons. And by the end of the, by the, end of the decade, he was able to... Uh, gathered together the assets and crew to make his directorial debut in the form of The Iron Giant, which was adapted from the book by Ted Hughes. Uh, the story centers on a nine-year-old boy by the name of Hogarth Hughes who befriends a... Uh, uh, how did you put it, Vinny? I believe I said an iron giant. Yes, and an innocent one who comes from outer space at that. Uh, meanwhile, there's a paranoid government agent by the name of Kent Mansley who's trying to hunt down and destroy this agent at all costs. And it's up to Hogarth Hughes to hide this iron giant at a junkyard owned by a junk artist by the name of Dean McCop. So this film was released originally in 1999, and this re-release had some added scenes. But I'm going to ask you, Vinny, what are your thoughts on the film as it was originally released in 1999 and has been the version that has existed in home entertainment, DVD, and whatnot? Yeah, well, initially, I didn't know who Brad Bird was or what he was capable of. Um, so I saw the commercial for this as a kid and was like, mm -hmm. that's cool, but meh. And then... Um, Which, by the way, let me segue. The reason for why this film, despite being a critical, uh, critical hit, didn't do so well at the box office because it didn't do so well in the marketing side so I wouldn't be surprised if you were sort of yeah, underwhelmed exactly. by the advertisements and there was a huge marketing push like they actually had like Burger King was going to do a big kids meal thing and I mm -hmm. guess it just never it just never um, went forward but um, yeah no I after seeing the Incredibles and Ratatouille I thought you know I, I got to check this film out I don't know why I never saw this when I was a kid and mm -hmm. I I like it I admire it for what it is because it's a very it's a very nostalgic Mm -hmm. film that you know goes back to those days in the, the 1950s 
um, 1960s during the mm -hmm. Cold War and sort of that um, superstition of, you know, we could be bombed at any minute mm -hmm. and then this new threat comes in. It's like, oh, now what are we going to do? Yeah. Um, so it was, I think it was a lot more mature than people anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's maybe that's one of the reasons why it also didn't get the uh, reception or the, um, the box office numbers it deserves. Mm -hmm. But um, not saying, I mean, saying that I, I don't like love it is not saying that I don't like it. I admire it for mm -hmm. what it is. It's a great movie. It's, I, I enjoy it every time I see it. Um, I just wouldn't say this is like, one of my favorite films of all time. Mm. I mean, like that, I, I love Brad Bird. Like he's directed two of my favorite films, Incredibles and Mission Impossible 4. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say this would jump out to me as one of the greatest animated movies, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's what I got. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think it's definitely a bit of a tepid response. This is a film that a lot of people love. And so it, 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 I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to say that I do love this film a fair amount. It's just that I don't think it's perfect. I think uh, at, some, at some points of the transitions between certain story parts are a little bit abrupt. The emotion doesn't fully organically carry through, uh, especially the third act. The third act goes way, comes, comes way too quickly and it rushes. And mm -hmm, I, I have mm -hmm. to say the more thematic moments uh, the, the more thematic lines that have to be spoken by the actors, they do sort of make me cringe. <laughs> and they could have done those in a more fresh way. But for a directorial debut, it blew my mind. Oh, I mean, definitely. Like, in, in a time definitely. when, like, I'm not surprised that it didn't get, it wasn't too successful at the time it was, it was released. We were still riding off of the coattails of the Disney Renaissance. A lot of films that weren't mm -hmm. Disney uh, weren't uh, getting that much attention. And with the rise of Pixar and CJ animation, uh, this hand-drawn animation, it was dying very quickly. So it was actually nice to see a sort of film like this. I didn't see this film when I was little. I've seen bits and pieces. But once I was able to see it for what it was, and having seen a lot of films from the 50s and 60s, like, say, The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming, uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, um, it was definitely very reminiscent of those times. And uh, Brad Bird definitely drew upon those influences. I mean, he grew up. It, the year that it, this film takes place, 1957, that was the year in which he was born. Mm -hmm. And to have it relate, and I'm, I'm a guy who used to want to be an astronaut, so the space stuff <laughs> connects. It, it has a bunch of elements that just make me feel really tingly inside. It's, just, it's not a perfect film, mm -hmm. but it is a well-beloved film, and it deserves to be such. Yeah, I, I, I forgot that this was his directorial debut. And yeah, yeah, I mean, with that being said, like, well done for him. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a great film for a directorial debut for his first time, so... Yeah. Hats off to him for that. And to uh, speak quickly on the, uh, this re-release has some uh, added in scenes that were cut out of the film or not completely animated yet. I have to say whether they add to the film or whether they improve my rating, uh, which I will give uh, in a couple of moments. I wouldn't say so. In fact, some of the moments make me question why in the world did they bother cutting them out anyway? It would have, you know, at least made uh, some character backgrounds a little bit more complete. And mm -hmm. with the one particular added scene, which is like a dream sequence of the Iron Giant thinking about the world in which he came from, it's nice. It doesn't really add too much to the story. A lot of these added scenes, they just add a little bit to what the characters are, but it doesn't really change the story as it were. And it doesn't exactly um, turn the film from being uh, just a film I love to a film I really love. Mm -hmm. Overall, what is your rating for this film? I'm going to go with a 7 out of 10 and uh, 3.5 out of 5 stars. Okay, okay. I liked it. No, I loved it. <laughs> it's not perfect, though, but I loved it. And I'm glad that it was re-released in theaters, and I'm actually looking forward to the documentary that they're going to make on not just the making of the film, but what happened as they were releasing it and why, mm. despite the critical acclaim that it received. I mean, there was a snippet af after the showing of the re-release that uh, Brad Bird literally said, we're gonna get a best picture nomination out of this. Ooh. Which, 1999, eh, but you know, I mean, Beauty and the Beast, it was only less than a decade ago, so it wasn't too far-fetched. And it movie. definitely would have appealed to the older Academy's sentiments, mm -hmm. and they're definitely of that age. Um, I'm looking forward to that. I'm gonna give this film four and a half out of five stars. Not perfect, but I love it. Uh, this re-released version should be appearing in the new Home Entertainment Edition on Blu-ray. So if you have the chance to purchase this, if you don't already own the film, 
If you really love the film, I'd say check it out, but if you already own the film on DVD, it might not be too necessary to purchase the film. But this film is a beloved classic, and I'm glad that it's finally getting the reception that it should have received when it was originally released in 1999. Yeah, very well deserved. Thanks for watching this show. Have you seen any good films lately? Be sure to let us know in the comment section below. Be sure to tune in next week when I review Pan, directed by Joe Wright, and the Spanish-language action comedy Ladrones. Also starting next week, I'll be reviewing all six Star Wars films for six weeks, starting with The Phantom Menace. Yes, The Phantom Menace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Be sure to also check out uh, the, the video in which I give a yearly update for my top 10 and my bottom 10, as well as the video in which I explain my five-star rating system. This was Not Two Critical Reviews. I'm Renard. And I'm Vince Salerno. See you next time.